Salam from EOK. And I'm Malika Bilal. The annual Oslo Freedom Forum brings together artists, entrepreneurs, and human rights advocates from around the world. Coming up, we chat with two notable speakers from this year's conference. That's today on the stream. We are live now on YouTube, so send your questions and comments, and Malika and I will do our very best to get them into this conversation. Hi, my name is Rosebel Kagumere. I am a Ugandan blogger and activist, and you're in the stream. Togolese blogger Farida Naburema has been threatened with violence ever since 2014 when she published the personal contacts of her country's parliament on social media. The daughter of an activist who was imprisoned multiple times by the father of the current Togolese president for Nusingbe. Farida has lived her life as an activist on the run, launching the hashtag 4 Must Go to demand President Nusingbe's removal from the office, among other social reforms. Musakua, the deputy leader of the now-banned opposition Cambodian National Rescue Party, has been in exile since 2017. Sakua has been a vocal critic of Prime Minister Hun Sen and the Cambodian People's Party. The CPP swept elections in July, but opposition activists dispute the result. Hun Sen's government has cracked down on political opposition, but recently released some dissidents from prison, including CNRP leader Kam Soka. So we're very pleased to welcome both Faridi Naburema and also Musa Kua from this year's Oslo Freedom Forum in New York City to the streams. Good to see you, ladies. Very good to see you. Uh, Sakua, you are living in exile right now for a politician who is so engaged in your country's history and development. What is that like? To be in exile is never a choice. Uh, it's, however, a, a security, and you need to keep your voice heard. Uh, no matter how far you are from the country, but as long as your voice is heard, mm -hmm. you keep democracy alive, and that is my plan. For people who are not following the progress of what's happening in Cambodia, or perhaps the lack of progress of what's happening in Cambodia, can you give us one vivid example of what it is that the opposition party, when it was allowed to exist, would be complaining about? Uh, today, Cambodia is a one-party state after the last July election, which was a sham election. Mr. Hun Sen, a former Khmer Rouge, and you know that the Khmer Rouge uh, regime killed over two million people, including my parents. Uh, this form, Mr. Hun Sen wants to stay in power much longer. Therefore, he had to take out the democratic forces from civil society to independent media, and then finally dissolving the only opposition party, the Cambodian National Rescue Party. The party is not only dissolved, but the opposition leader, our leader, Mr. Kam Soka, and another leader, Mr. Kam Soka is in prison, has been in prison for the past year, and another leader, Mr. Sam Rangsi, has been in exile. And we have 118 of us at the top level of the opposition have been banned from po political activities. That's what um, the situation right now. But we are not going to let Mr. Hun Sen and his party take a chance uh, to run, to take the country uh, to a, a dictatorship much longer. Cambodia needs to be back on track with, with democracy. And that is the only way to give our people the hope and to keep um, democracy alive in Cambodia. So, Sakua, there are some questions here about how specifically you can do that to put Cambodia back on track, as you say. This is a tweet we got from someone who says, recently, I've seen that the opposition's interior is broken. It's broken between the two leaders that you mentioned, Sam Rainey's supporters and Kem Soka's supporters. So I want to know how that happened and how it can get back to normal and if there's any hope that they can come back to politics in Cambodia. So your thoughts for the opposition being dissolved, how will they then be able to form that united front? We have very strong support inside the country. Don't be, uh, forget that we got 44% of the votes, meaning three, over 3 million half of the country. And we have a very, very strong uh, Cambodian diaspora in, um, in Europe, in the United States, in Australia. Um, on top of that, we have leaders who are still very, very committed to, and youth as well, to democracy. We have a common goal, which is putting uh, democracy uh, back on track. 
We are a democratic um, party. Therefore, we have ideas. We have strategies that don't always match. So we express ourselves. It does not mean that we are broken from inside. They mm. want to break us, but to the contrary, we are alive with our voices heard, and these conversations make it sound like we are broken. We are not. I just want to show some pictures, Ms. Saku, of when you were more active on Twitter. That takes us back to 2015. I'm going to show them, and you can tell us what, you, what was going through your mind at the time. This was an act of defiance that you were doing involving Freedom Park. Very briefly explain what that was. That was when Freedom Park, which is like Hyde Park in London, a place where people can express themselves and use it as p for public expression, uh, was closed down because too many people that were with the opposition were using the park, so they closed it down. Mm. And I said, no, uh, we we marched on to Freedom Park for over two months and then defied uh, the, um, even sometimes um, the tanks. Uh, we have to be to show to the youth actually that they are they belong to at Freedom Park and there's no way we should uh, let Freedom Park take be taken over by these forces. So we have to fight for uh, freedom of expression, freedom of gathering, freedom of being alive. And the most uh, the best time to be alive in dictatorship is at Freedom Park. Mm -hmm. And then for our viewers who don't know, of course, you went to jail in 2014 for protesting in Freedom Park. So I want to bring up this tweet with that in mind. This is from Alpha who says, I can't imagine activists not being immediately put in prison in Cambodia if they organize. I don't think there is any room at all for human rights activists to organize in Cambodia anymore. Many people jailed this last year with really zero substantive evidence at all. What would your message be to Cambodians still in Cambodia who want to organize. Keep fighting. Keep expressing yourselves. You can use social media. You don't have to be confrontational, but you can and you must express um, the uh, your feelings, your ideas, your thoughts uh, about corruption without having to... You have to find a way, which is a strategy, strat strategic way to uh, work with, uh, to fight dictatorship is um, freedom of expression without uh, going to jail, which means telling the truth, but at the same time, the giving solutions rather than attacking the dictator, but saying um, for the, uh, for Cambodia, for the whole of Cambodia, can the, the dictator say no uh, if but you have to uh, understand that Mr. Hun Sen is also trying to get the workers, for example, get the farmers, for example, on his side as well, especially the youth. So you have to uh, play with his game, which is to uh, bring the forces behind you, which is uh, voices, the voices of the youth. And if the youth are afraid because they are intimidated by Mr. Hun Sen, that is not the way to fight a dictator. The youth actually are the power and they should be using their voices through social media. Mm. Musaku's advice to Cambodians uh, who want to organize, tell the truth and don't be intimidated. So I want to share a comment from someone who is doing just that in another country, in Vietnam. Uh, take a look at this headline, Why Mai Kui, Vietnam's Lady Gaga, performs in secret in her country. She's actually also a participant at the Oslo Freedom Forum. And she's often been dubbed Lady Gaga due to her activism and her style. So have a listen to what that sounds like. Here she is performing at the Freedom Forum. I just want to be free To desire our society Want the right to be human Living free from tyranny So she was actually banned from singing publicly in her country for speaking out about freedom of expression and, and freedom of speech. She sent us a video comment from the forum, and this is what she had to say. I am an independent artist. I don't think of myself as an activist. I just do things to make people think and act in the new ways. But in Vietnam, people label this activism. One challenge is 
people have certain expectation about what is activism and how activists should act. So this makes my work twice as hard. I have to face control from both from the government and from the conservative society. Farida, I want to bring you in here. You know, you heard her say she doesn't consider herself an activist because it raises all types of questions about what is activism and what does an activist look like. Can you relate to that? Do you consider yourself an activist? I definitely do. Uh, I believe that I am an activist because uh, activists are people who are fighting to change the course of things in their community and change the course of things for the better. Activists are usually fighting for a cause and they believe in organizing communities uh, and they believe in citizens' voices. And that's what I do, empowering citizens, organizing citizens. To that extent, I am an activist. Mm. Farida, I want to show you a picture. And it's a picture of you just a few moments ago on the stage at the Oslo Freedom Forum in New York. And there's a quote here, Togo's prisons can be compared with a living hell. Uh, and this is you just talking just a little while ago. This is you on stage, um, a very striking picture just behind. There will be people who don't know what's going on in Togo. If there was a description that you could give them to understand why it is that you take so many risks, what would that description be? My country has been ruled by the oldest military regime in Africa. The very first bloody coup in Africa in 1963 was conducted in Togo. And that is a past that we want to break away from. My grandfather fought against this regime. My father did, and I did. I feel like dictatorship is the only thing that we inherit in Togo. And that is not an inheritance that I want to pass on to my own children. Uh, us being ruled by the same family for five decades is just too much. And not only we are being denied of our basic human rights, but on top of that, this regime has failed in terms of delivering any economic growth to the country. And today, Togo is in the top 10 poorest country in the world. And four times consecutively, my people have, been, uh, have made it as the poorest, as the most unhappy people on earth. That is, that is a very appalling thing. And I want things to change for the better because Togo deserves so much better than what we are having right now under the Nyasimbe family. Mm. I'm looking at protest video right now, and what's remarkable about this, I mean, this could be anywhere, anywhere in the world, but you cannot protest in Togo. Because why? <laughs> the government said that they lost two guns last year during a protest that were confiscated from soldiers. And until we find these two guns, we cannot protest anymore. I hear what you're saying there. I wanted to bring in this comment for you. Um, this is Boris on Twitter, who says, impunity is at the core of this crisis in Togo. For half a century, one clan has taken over power, and lots and lots of crimes have been committed. Is it possible for this regime to accept peaceful regime change? And you know, they have a hashtag in there, uh, wanting an exit in 2020. How possible do you think that is, Farida? I think it's all the possibility depends on the peoples of Togo, uh, 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 you know, it's about us, you know, fighting to want for change. It's about us refusing uh, uh, to give up and to give in. It's about us being determined to go all the way till the end. Of course, it's going to come with a lot of consequences, but we have paid a heavy price over the past decade. So it, the future of Togo is the like hands of Consequences like what? You, you, you just kind of glided over consequences, but I know from doing research on you and from going through your Twitter feed that the consequences have been high and heavy for you. Can you give us an example? Consequences such as people getting arrested, detained and tortured severely, people getting killed, soldiers going into homes and beating citizens, throwing tear gas in their room to force them out so they can beat them and kill them. These are heavy consequences that the people of Togo have been facing for daring to ask for change. Um, of course, it's not going to be easy. That is why we keep raising awareness and mobilizing support from whatever we can get that. Um, our country has been very much isolated for so many reasons. Uh, we are a French-speaking country. We are relatively small, one of the smallest countries on the continent. As a result, we do not get a lot of coverage or attention. So the regime 
she was emboldened by that. In 2005, when the people of Togo opposed Fonya Singh by taking over after his father died, five countrymen were executed. But nothing has happened. There was no consequence whatsoever. And like Boris said, impunity has always galvanized the regime because they feel emboldened by the fact that they can kill as many citizens as they want mm. and nothing will happen to them. You talk about being emboldened, and I know that you have uh, received death threats, but not anonymous death threats. You know who they're coming from. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I have received threats from all of other places, uh, from government cronies to some ministers in the government. Um, and, well, as an activist and as a, somebody who is fighting against a dictatorship, unfortunately, there is something that I have managed to accept as being a natural consequence of what I am doing. Um, so when I receive these threats, I just feel like I have hit in the right place and I'm doing a good job. Uh, because they feel threatened by us. Uh, their, rule, their rule, their leadership, their hegemony is threatened by us. Um, and of course, the only way they can respond to this is by, by trying to get rid of us and by trying to uh, uh, um, silence us. So hearing both of your stories, Musakua and Ferida, uh, people online have lots of questions for you. And many of them themselves are activists and others um, are looking to you for a few answers. So this is Andrew, who sent us a chain of questions that I'm going to pose to you both. But I'll pick the one I find the most interesting is number two. Sometimes the people you fight for are the ones fighting you. What's kept them moving in the direction of their goal? Um, Ferida, you want to go first? Yes, you know, when you are an activist, there's one very interesting thing. The people you are fighting for will fight you. The people you are fighting with will fight, will fight you. And the people you are fighting against will also fight you. Sometimes people do not understand the reason behind someone taking so much risk to demand change. And sometimes people have not tasted change before. They don't know what is different. They don't know better. As a result, they are even afraid of it because their whole life they have been sold the propaganda and they started to believe in it. But sometimes people are actually scared because they feel like you who are asking for change are exposing all of them. And you are taking risks that is going to make them uh, 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 pay for things they did not ask for. As a result, they are scared and they will fight you naturally. But... Freedom is something that I believe every human being deep down wants. And when you keep preaching and you keep pushing, at the end of the day, they will start admiring and respecting your courage and your dedication. And finally, they'll buy into it and they'll be convinced enough to understand why you are standing for your cause and they'll follow you. You have to keep on uh, put, focusing on what we are fighting for and not who we are fighting. What we are fighting for is our belief. The, the belief of the fundamental rights, fundamental freedoms, and also to protect the people who do not have a voice. So stay focused all the time we are attacked, and especially as women. And I, I, I have an American passport. I was educated in the West. I was married uh, to um, an American a man who passed away. So all of that is against us. Again, uh, so the activists, the revolutionaries. So we have learned, and I have learned to delete. And I say to people all the time, delete, delete what they want to uh, use to make you lose focus. You say, my focus is here with me, in my head, in my heart, in the struggle of my people. You can call me anything you want. But one thing, one thing, you cannot derail my mind. Mm -hmm. And I think it is the strength that you get from day to day. The comments, especially with social media, you are so tempted to read comments. Fine, read the comments. Uh, look, read the uh, positive as well as but the, the uh, constructive, uh, negative, constructive and negative mm -hmm. uh, comments. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is about you. Do you stop and fear, think about the fear and the risk? No. You move on, but move on strategically. And one thing also, don't move alone. Move the, with the rest. 
And I totally agree with what you just said, Mo. And I, I, I think that when you are fighting, the cause that you're fighting for is the one thing that you have to keep your focus on. At the end of the day, once you believe in that cause, it is beyond everything else. I remember saying once that of the 7 million of people that we are in Togo, if 6 million, 900,000, and 99, meaning if all of them except me are still okay with leading under dictatorship, I will fight them all and defeat that dictatorship. Mm. It's not because I believe that I'm more powerful than all my countrymen, but I believe that my belief in freedom is not something that I can trade. And I will not give up no matter how many people are against that freedom or are afraid of that freedom. Ladies, you both have uh, reputations uh, and uh I'm going to touch on, on one for each of you. So, Sakua, you have a reputation for being a politician that uses music and sound and singing and your voice on the campaign trail. Tra and when I said, is it appropriate to ask you to do that in this show, you said what? You know, when I cannot express myself anymore, it comes out. <laughs> Me and Dai, me and Sai, me and Jomka. We, the people of Cambodia, we used to have land and we used to have river and mountains. Now we have nothing left. It's just come out on the campaign trail when you see the farms being taken away, when you see our indigenous people crying because the ancestral land is now the uh, project of the Chinese companies. How can you not cry out? How could you, can you not sing? Wow, that's, it's, the, it's beautiful. I, I feel it right now. I, I can't believe that people complain that you sing on the campaign trail. It's very effective. And Farida, a, a real contrast. People call you the angry girl. Why do they do that in your country, in your home country? It's like, that, it is that because, angry girl again. It is because I, I carry the, angry, the anger sorry, of 8 million people. I usually say that if all of us were just a little bit, it would be different. And I have to manage to be angry for 8 million people and scream loud enough for our voice to be heard outside of Togo. Mm. Angry for 8 million, not easy, but uh, you do it well. I want to bring in this comment we got via Instagram. We asked our community there, what challenges do human and civil rights activists face where they live? And we got a response from South Africa. Levi says, shrinking space for civil society engagement in many, if not most, political spaces in East and Southern Africa. We also got that same idea on Twitter. This is Winnie who says, in recent times, we've witnessed the shrinking space of human rights defenders. So so it's not just in one part of the world, it's in many. Um, uh, Sukua, what would you say to people who say that they feel like they are almost claustrophobic in the uh, amount of space they have to do human rights work? This is why we have to be strategic. This is why the Oslo Freedom Forum is so important. Hearing what Frida is going through, to hearing what Mike Hoy is going through in Vietnam uh, gives me ideas and together uh, we give um, we hug each other. We say, sisters, we can make it. And this is the space in our head, in our, in our minds. And the people will say, space is shrinking. Yes, space is shrinking. However, we have to um, change, move our strategy to, uh, so that this space can be widened widened by pulling in more people. And that's why we have to put democracy as a on the global map. Mm -hmm. It's not just about Cambodia or Togo or Vietnam or Mozambique anymore. It's the global democracy. Farida, in a sentence, what keeps you going? I believe that way too, much too many sacrifices were made for us to give us at a point, you know, my biggest inspiration is my grandfather who used to walk over 500 kilometers round trip sure. to attend protests for independence. And that was in the 1950s. So it's and your grandfather that's your inspiration. I'm going to leave it there. Yes. So Farida and Sakua, thank you so much for being part of this program. Malika, where do you want to leave us? I'll end with a comment specific to Africa, but 
also could be extrapolated elsewhere. Matar says, we appreciate your efforts, not only as a Togolese activist, but also as an African. As you rightly said, no one is born ready for revolution. We have to prepare for it. It's time for all to say no to injustice and violent atrocities from dictators across the continent. Thank you so much, everybody, for following us. You can do so on Twitter as well. We're at AJStream. Malika and I will see you next time. Take care. Thank you.